committee of the whole meeting. Please rise for a pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing. Will I take a moment of silence? Honoring Officer Kara Stum, badge 199, passed away last week. She's been a member of the town of Poughkeepsie Police Department since 2019. We ask the community to keep Kara's family, loved ones, and fellow officers in their thoughts and prayers as they mourn this loss. Thank you. In tonight's presentation, we have um, Mitchell Associates will here to discuss the Poughkeepsie Day School and moving the police department and court facility over there. And after that, we'll have committee reports. Um, just as we get ready to, to start, I'd like to bring up that we have a police station that is of subpar standards at this time. And we've gone through multiple studies to come to this conclusion. We had a joint study with through the county that we did on the police station town court facility at Arlington Fire at one time. We backed away from that due to the expense and we hired Mitchell and Associates to take on a police court facility <coughs> study and town hall to see if we can find a location. We've visited multiple locations throughout the town over the few years that we did this study and we've come to this conclusion so far is where we're going. So we asked Mitchell and Associates to come at this time and present their findings and the direction that they think we should be following in. People do know this police station has had issues for the last few years, settling issues and, and different things going on over there. And our police department deserves a building with a better standard than what they're having now. If the building has issues and it'd be of a lengthy cost and an exuberant amount of money to fix what's over there currently. Bob and crew, good evening. Share my screen and show the presentation about uh, the progress that's been made with the design and analysis for uh, providing facilities for the town for uh, police, courts, and town hall services uh, in this instance at the Poughkeepsie Day School property. So I'm Bob Mitchell. This is my associate, Ken Gale. Um, so let me start. Okay, so the, the team that's doing this work includes ourselves. Uh, Mitchell Associates is a seven-person firm that specializes in municipal buildings, more in the public safety side than in the administrative side, but, but in any event, plenty of experience. Uh, Michael McCune, who you see as the next bullet down, is, uh, has done some uh, 90 police station projects and we've been working together. Well, we've known each other since the 60s, the 1960s, and uh, we've been working together steadily since 2007 and have done some 36 projects in the time period between then and now that involve some combination that includes police station, which is where his specialty is. Uh, Williams Architects, Ted Stromswold in particular, uh, is who has participated in doing the programming and layout work related to the town hall requirements. And Berger Engineering, who is a local firm you may know, is a civil engineer and uh, site engineering for the project. Uh, Mitchell Associates works all over the Northeast predominantly. We've done over, mm, we've done oh, just about 200 public safety projects. And that's, that's sort of where our activity is rooted. And uh, some of the recent things nearby that we've done, uh, City of Newburgh, we did a study to consolidate facilities and replace their police and fire <coughs> and city hall. Uh, it's, they haven't been able to proceed, but they may proceed. They're sort of feeling their way back out again. Uh, Beacon is about to go to bid in January for a new fire headquarters. Uh, we did some studies for Philadelphia related to fire stations, Ellsworth, Maine. These are just representative, by not by any means all of what we do. Ellsworth, Maine, a composite facility for municipal services. And uh, as it says here, Michael and I have worked on 22 other public safety. It's actually a very number, 36. And 
Michael himself has done, he said, I said 90 before, this is 70. I believe the 90 is actually the correct number. And Williams has done over 80 municipal projects. So we have some practice. Architecture is called a practice, like medicine and law. It's something you never fully master. You just keep getting better, hopefully. Uh, you learn more. Uh, we're engaged with different organizations that provide guidance in the type of building we're doing here. Uh, Michael, in particular, is involved with the IACP and uh, Kalia and I'm and Ken are involved with FEMA, NFPA, and other society, organizations like that that provide guidance to do these kind of buildings. That Ken sits on actually a committee with NFPA that has to do with firefighter safety and health. I know there's no fire station at this point, but I, the point of bringing it up is that we're involved in the community of people who do this work, uh, not just doing the work. Uh, we started this work back in 2018 and published in 19 a study of a prior scheme for the town that involved merging uh, their facility with Arlington Fire District. And what came out of it was a proposal for a large facility down near IBM on property uh, in a cloverleaf down there. You may be familiar with it. Uh, in the Since then, we've worked on analysis for the Poughkeepsie Day School site, a site overview, and in 22 programming and needs analysis for, with, leading up to this presentation tonight. And uh, we're going to talk about those. We're going to talk about some potential revenue sources that can help offset some of the cost of the project and compare this project with some other local and regional municipal uh, new construction projects around the issue of cost. Uh, so, Ken, I think it's your turn at this point. It is my turn. Uh, so, to find out what how we got to where we are now, we have to look about where we've been. The first study, as Bob had mentioned, involved uh, potential consolidation with the Arlington Fire District in a campus-style setting of multiple new construction buildings. Uh, all buildings as we would make anything on the Poughkeepsie Bay School are permanent buildings, they're public buildings, civic spaces. Um, and it's all in an effort to consolidate services, overlap commonalities between different offices and departments, and eventually provide cost savings through this consolidation. So the study back then included a uh, town hall, both police station and the auto center, the courthouse, which is in the same building as the police station, and then four Arlington Fire Department stations. Okay. We took a look at the existing conditions of town hall to start with. Town hall fared very well. It's not that old of a building. Uh, it's uh, one drawback is uh, because of the two-story um, entry points and some steep grades. Drainage could be an issue here. And expandability out into the uh, tree line of the adjacent parcel uh, could prove difficult. Okay. Police and court building. From, from a walkthrough perspective, if you stay out of certain corridors, you might think the police building's in pretty good shape. The paint looks pretty good, the carpeting, a little bit of wear, but when you drill down to the more important things, all of the mechanical is, uh, is uh, in need of replacement, uh, but the biggest item was the site was built on a land. That's just not uh, that's just not wise uh, wise to stay in this building. Uh, Jay had mentioned that the building is not up to standards. It's actually in failing condition from a structural technology. The, the slabs are sinking. Uh, they are going to sink to a point where they might start interrupting connections in the structural frame of the building. So. Uh, there's an immediate need to get out of the building at our least possibility. This was from our 2018-2019 study. Okay. Uh, just some photos of the existing conditions. Um, I'm actually going to point. So in this, in this slab area, the 
this whole black area is a void. This floor is to touch mm -hmm. this concrete slab. The wall doesn't hit the floor, in other words. Yeah. Say again? The wall doesn't meet the floor. Correct. The floor has dropped down several inches. The floor left. Uh, and this occurs throughout the, the facility. You'll see in the upper I, I can pull, right I can picture. Pull here. Uh, that's by the IT room. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So uh, that's the IT room currently, and we have uh, the, the door doesn't close anymore. Uh, it's so racked. And this is just happening throughout. If you go into the adjacent tenant space, there's actually pieces of concrete sticking up out of the ground. It is uh, it's very disturbing to see. Okay, Bob. More of the same. Uh, wherever there were joint boards, we have tripping hazards, we have more sinking walls, and uh, it's creating what Bob is showing there is in the evidence room. Uh, those are all pieces of four foot by eight foot sheetrock boards, and all the joints are breaking apart from the cell. Now, right at the top of that is the structural frame. So it's only a matter of time before the foundations holding the columns start doing some shooting themselves. That's all. Uh, we just have more of the same. This is on the court side. Uh, there's the IT room again in the upper left. Upper right is uh, cracking running right through mm -hmm. the uh, existing court space in the building. Lower left. They've actually put yellow tape where they were afraid people were going to tread on the entryway to the security entrance to the court. And on the right side, it's just, uh, you can see that pallet there and those boxes. It's, it's supposed to be a flat floor. Right behind those, those boxes is an open void in the floor that causes the pallet, which should sit level, to be tilting counterclockwise. So this is just the sampling. So physical conditions for structural failures and environmental concerns are going to make this site unfeasible to clean up. The minute you want to try to remediate this site, you don't know what you're going to find. Uh, it's an uncapped landfill and our recommendation uh, which was concurred by uh, all, all personnel we spoke to at the police uh, location was to relocate at the earliest facility. So some numbers, it's also undersized. This is between uh, the police and courthouse portion of the building. It was about a quarter undersized uh, from uh, programming and analysis that Bob will speak to later. So the study results came up with the town hall analysis needing about 30,450 square feet and the police court 66.4. So it told us that for these functions, we need about 96,850 square feet. And that's in 2019? That was in 2019 based on discussions with these people. So now what what did that cost? These are our numbers at the top of the sheet from the 2019 study, which based construction on happening in 2022, and it was $66.63 million. All new construction, new site, 50, 75 year permanent buildings, if you will. And that was three years ago. We took those numbers and used current escalation pricing that we could confirm with our professional estimator. And that would put that same study we did in 2019, $72 million if we did it, if it was on the table today as what was the current project. Again, that's all new construction. So when you talk about construction costs, one of the most important factors is your cost per square foot, because that's going to tell you, all right, if I, if I eliminate the gymnasium, how many square feet is that? What would that say? I mean, it's ways to quickly see what the spaces are drawing. So at 96,850 square feet, $744 per square foot, 
if it was at midpoint of construction 2024. So we're going to be revisiting that number several times later through the cost analysis. So I just want to clarify that the 744 is if the concept <coughs> developed in 2019 minus Arlington Fire District was being built starting in this coming year. Okay. Thanks, Bob. Yeah. So this was one of the final site plan options uh, that we came up with in the 2019 study. Uh, lower left, you have Bob. Help me recall. Lower left was police and courts. Police and courts, with the upper right being uh, fire headquarters. Yeah. Well, actually, yeah. Uh, I, I take that back. The lower left was town hall and courts. Correct. And the upper right was police and fire. And we obviously, we, as I said earlier, we extrapolated all the fire uh, building space out of the numbers I just presented. So that's good on that. Uh, uh, so now I want to talk about the Gibson J School site. Uh, it's a large, help me uh, with the numbers, Bob, go to the next slide. Yeah, 34. So it's a 34 acre site. It's uh, it's a wonderful site if you've ever been down the road. Um, it has a lot of history. This will be posted up on the town website. I'm not going to go through all the architectural history of it. But what's promising about it is the sheer size of it and the amount of existing building square footage that can be reused. Also, that the existing building, particularly the Gilkerson building, because it was built new by IBM, was built to the standard that, that IBM built, which is a very high standard that you don't see generally. So we have two structures, basically, on Gibson K School site. We have the Gilkinson building that Bob started to talk about, and we have the Kenyon House, which is an old mansion but was built very robustly. It has thick masonry, load-bearing walls, and it's very promising for uh, renovation, and it's very receptive to some additions we need to do to bring up the current code. Okay, some quick facts about the site, uh, and this will be related to town amenities that can be brought into it. There's an existing baseball field that will be left in place. There's an existing uh, full-size soccer field that's going to be relocated because we need some of the parking space where it currently is. Relocating a soccer field isn't an expensive venture, by the way, because it's just repainting the grass. Uh, we also have a full-size theater. And there's going to be a lot of extra space left over that can be dedicated to senior and community meeting space. Uh, it's, it's called to be generically renovated, and it hasn't been fully uh, assigned a value of what it will be. But because of the size of the existing Gilkinson building, there's a lot of uh, potential to add uh, some community spaces separate egress points into that portion of the building. The site also has, and I'll talk about this later, an existing solar array that's saving about 50000 a year in electrical costs and an AT&T cell tower, which is bringing in currently 32000 a year in revenue. Anyone that purchases this property picks up all this revenue stream with the property. So this is the uh, circa 1913 mansion. Uh, it's a wonderful building. It'll it'll renovate into a very spectacular town space. Um, the grounds are well kept. The additions that we came up with uh, work well with the scheme, and uh, we can keep flipping above. The site. Again, it's generous. It's going to allow for all the parking that's going to be needed for all the court functions, for all the daily police shifts and overlap of shifts. Um, the site's going to need some overhaul and 
on landscaping and some and asphalt things, but these are these are real low hanging fruit pieces. The the building itself is in quite remarkable shape for its age. Uh, the Kenyon House itself, again, its cover, its concrete with stucco overlay, structural clay within the concrete walls. Everything's built to last. And uh, we did a we did a very thorough review of it. Day School is actually doing a lot of upkeep on the barrel clay roof tiles over the years, and they kept great records. Of all, I looked at all of that, and that actually helped us in our uh, pricing for when we show you some additions later. We knew what the cost would be for the uh, <coughs> for the additions to the roof lines to make it all look similar. This is just more shots of the grounds. Now we're looking at the Gilkinson building. And it's pretty hard to get the Gilkinson building in one shot unless you do a very long landscape photo. So this is looking at it from the, uh, from the front grounds of the Canyon building. And we can keep going, Bob. The existing building's about 70,000 square feet. Uh, access to the site and the site in general, I should say, there's three or four access points. We're gonna be reusing a couple of them and bringing in a couple of new ones to help the police have some secure access and to deal with more incoming traffic. They'll go to the Kenyon house that we were just talking about because the building department's gonna run out of there. So we're gonna have the public coming in and out as well as all the staff working there. Sites of the grounds. The biggest downfall of the Gilkinson building, frankly, is the facade needs to be upgraded. And for a building that's gonna be, have town hall functions, court functions, and part of the police connection to the new two-story building we'll show you later, it needs to be renovated anyway. You want something more lasting, more durable, nothing that needs maintenance. This is stucco and wood. Uh, this is stuff that has to get redone every five, ten years. Uh, we'd be looking at more lasting materials on the new building like masonry and, uh, and the like. Um, we took a look at the existing drawings from IBM. Excellently built. The structural frame on the building will require little upgrades from a seismic perspective, which is, which is pretty amazing for something built in 1963. Uh, but that's how IBM built. There's some shots of what uh, is gonna be gained just without even touching some of these spaces. There's a full-size NCAA regulation gym that's fairly new. I think it's 10, maybe 12 years old, and uh, it's in great shape. Uh, above the picture of the gym is a large entry hall with very big, generous skylights, a lot of natural light pouring in. Um, that's going to stay as part of the design. On the right-hand side, top is one of the existing, that was the existing cafeteria. It's got a full-size commercial kitchen. All the equipment's still there. All the equipment's still working. That can get recouped for whatever the town desires, and there could be options for community-related functions in there as well. Lower right, the theater was renovated with funds from uh, James Earl Jones. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was done very well, very high tech, sound boards up and down. They made the, uh, the ramping ADA compliant, all their seating, it's in phenomenal condition. So as part of the the study that we've done in this past year, we went back to the programming that had been done in 2018 and revisited it. Uh, programming is the means by which you determine what spaces are needed. And it turns, it generates this kind of a report, a spreadsheet. So here we see the required square footage for town hall. This, you see all the individual <clears throat> rooms identified, town board, town supervisor, finance, town clerk, etc. And each of the departments in the town were visited and interviewed and this size is required 
determined and recorded, and you'll see in a little bit, we'll show you floor plans that reflect that. So that was done for town hall, it was done for town courts, uh, it was then, it was also done for the police, and came up with the areas that we'll be discussing in a moment, uh, to, for building areas, that these in turn, uh, wait, let me come back here, uh, sorry. These were done initially, the mission that we were given was to determine if the needs of the town could be met on the property. So a simple approach would be to just say, this is how many square feet we need, this is how many square feet you need, so therefore you're gonna build that many square feet. But we went beyond that and drew plans of how each building would be used because Frankly, part of deciding that it's an acceptable solution is to be convinced that the layout works for you. So we moved forward and developed plans. So here is Gilkison, and what you see here are two aspects of this. First, let's focus on the administrative areas in it that relate to town hall operation. As you come in on the right, there's recreation. As you come in on the left, there's water and sewage and receiver of taxes. As you come up the sheet a little bit, I should point so you can see better. Let me get this. Town clerk and town hall chamber. And here's the theater. You have all this large supporting bathroom structure there already. And this would be the portion of town administrative spaces located in this building. The area that has the cafeteria and all that is over on the left here and is available for whatever purpose you decide <coughs> to put to it. And there's been discussion about senior services as a possibility. I, I want that to be remembered because when we talk about the cost of this project compared with the cost of the prior project, this project includes other amenities that were not included in the prior project this area of the cafeteria for whatever services might be there, area above it that has expansion capability for town government services, the theater, and the gym. <coughs> In Kenyon House, it's a, there's four stories to it, counting the basement. So here's the basement, and right now the only things programmed in that space are the town historian and storage. So it is an area available for expansion of services. You know, one of, one of the little mantras we use in our work, because we just do municipal buildings, is you want a building to grow into, not out of. If you move into a building where you're using every square foot of it on day one, you're certainly gonna be in trouble in year 10. So these buildings provide that as part of the cost of acquiring and renovating them. This is the first floor. The first floor has uh, building and zoning. It, it has the assessor. There's has public conference room. So building and zoning, assessor, public conference room, record storage, and a, a lobby. And the, the spaces are quite beautiful. The people who walk into the lobby will have a real sense of having arrived at something that is good about their town. And the, uh, the, the uh, public meeting room, this uh, small conference room, is uh, probably the most beautiful room in the building. It has a fireplace and beautiful wood casework. And uh, people will be uh, inspired by being in those spaces if they're sitting and having a meeting. The second floor of the building focuses on the supervisor's offices and engineering department. There's also going to be planning and there's going to be <coughs> internal conference rooms for staff meetings. And then the third floor of the building has, has a legal finance and the controller. And we'll, I should point out that the first and second floor will have easy access for the public with the expectation that they'll be coming for meetings or for services. And the third floor is less so. But all of them are served by this tower element that's being added. Okay, you can see it here on the left. 
This tower element provides ADA compliant vertical circulation, staircase, elevator, and ADA compliant bathrooms for each floor of the building. And uh, here you can see it closer, two bathrooms, an elevator, and the stair. And it's in a new structure that's a, a rated assembly as the code would want for safe exiting, meaning fire rated. And this is how we view it being added to the building. That's the building that is, as it is now. And it, it's going to appear in a moment in this inside corner of the building and will look like that. So we believe it'll fit in. It won't look like somebody just stuck a staircase on the building. And then on the other end of the building where uh, the building department is, there's a need to add space. So what's happening here is currently this section here is what had once upon a time been an outside porch that IBM enclosed. And we're adding another structure beyond it to provide the spaces that are needed for the building department. So this is the building as it is now, and this is how it would be with the added space. So we're we're hoping and believing that it is architecturally convincing for town that the building when visited later will not look like somebody added something to it it'll just look like it organically evolved over time and the, uh, and the renderings we're presenting are work in progress and will be developed further oh yeah yeah so keeping in mind that the mission was not design the buildings it was make sure they fit but we don't know how to control ourselves so huh. we, we continued because it's fun to be honest so so the programming process developed a set of criteria for the court to seat 220 people and the the design that michael McCune worked up was uh, reviewed in depth <coughs> with uh, the court staff, Judge Bryant, Arlene Bryant, Ariel Bryant, and the New York State Court architect, Edward Robbins. So the, they, this, the state court provides that service if you pester them and get some time with them. And, uh, and in the end of it, they're going to have to sign off on it anyway. So best to get that known now. So that court is in the rear part of Gilkeson, if you've been in it, we'll zoom in here a little bit. This this area here is currently an open courtyard surrounded by classrooms. So we're going to enclose the courtyard, and the area in pink here is the areas that the public would be accessing for <coughs> court purposes. And I, we're not. I'm not capable in the way Michael McCune would be to describe each room, which I didn't think was necessary for tonight, but he's available by phone if the issue comes up. But this is the public entrance is here, and this is the court, this is the dais where the judges and the lawyers and the jury, and the spaces around here are support spaces for the judges, for the jury to be out for the staff for records to be stored and there's secure parking and secure entering for those people separate from the public entering uh, prisoners that are brought in would be brought into a sally port here and the area in tan is the area where they are secured and brought into the court where they are brought in in a way that they cannot interact with the public either coming or going. And uh, there's, you can see here, there's a, another opening, another connector here that connects the police station where people who are already prisoners of the police department can be brought across to come into court. The entrance to the court will be a new exterior space between the police station that's on the right in the existing Gilkison building with the court entrance back here in the back of the courtyard. 
So police programming was done by Michael, and as I indicated before, he's done, I believe it's 90 police stations, and uh, worked with the police chief uh, on the program, and came up with a program that requires 40,000 square feet of space to function now and into the future. And that is a new addition. So right here, this is the edge of the existing Gilkeson. I'm oh, sorry, here, 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 right. and here. So this is new construction, a new two-story police station with a public entry and police entry on the back and a police sally port here. And, uh, and this has a second floor on it and we can go into the organization of the spaces. I don't think that's necessarily the purpose of tonight's meeting and I'm not as qualified as Michael. So we can, at any point, we can have a, another review meeting of that. But this is what we think it would look like. And the design process is a work in progress. So this thing may evolve to look a little bit differently from this, but this reflects the general size. Well, it, it reflects the exact size of what's been drawn. And you see this archway here in the background here is the entry into the courtyard for the court. And this is Gilkeson, the portions that will be town offices. And this glassy area is the public entrance to the police station. And around back on the right are the private entrances for the police staff. And the site is laid out to control privacy between those two areas. So the police can come in and park and get into the building and not be confronted by people, members of the public, who might have some cause to have a grudge. Behind the building in the back will be an auxiliary building that will have to do with vehicle maintenance and, uh, and supplies and a, a firing range for training purposes. <coughs> so this is the site plan that's proposed, the area in black here is the existing Gilkeson. The area over here is Canyon with the existing circular drive. Here's the police station addition, and here's the auxiliary building. So up here you see an impound yard that can hold 100 vehicles. You see here 45 parking spaces for police, and here you see the public parking around here, 70s, 74, 50, and 40. Over here, you see the relocated soccer field and the ball field. So the, these green lines here are existing driveways that are being turned back, either to grass or parking lot. Uh, this is an existing, this is a new drive in, and this is a new drive in on the left, and the new drive on the left allows police and court people to come privately to a secure parking area in the back. I think it's it is my turn. Okay. So now we get into a lot of numbers and uh, try to go through them with you at a quick enough pace, but to not lose you. So here we have the, um, the main components that we need to cover. We have town hall, we have police and we have court. The existing square footages for these uh, functions total 60,000 square feet. Um, we are presenting a new total square foot of design space of 103,115 square feet. But the most important part about this slide is the two center columns, Reno versus new construction. Um, one of the, uh, the, I think the biggest benefit of this site is the amount of renovation square footage that the town will gain versus the new build requirement. So we need about 42,000 square feet of new construction built. Yet we have almost, well, we have over 60,000 square feet of existing building that just needs to be renovated which is a much smaller cost than new construction. I could, I could put a precise 
percentage comparison to it before COVID, I can't do that. It's, it, things, are, are, uh, things are tough to keep up with. But uh, this balance shows that a lot more work will be done at a cheaper price per square foot than if we built all new as the 2019 study uh, showed us. Okay. So now we break it down even further uh, so we can get some of those cost per square foot numbers. So we're taking, we're taking all the new square footages for all the facilities and breaking it out into their related cost per square foot. So for town hall, we're having a total of 22,945 square feet. That's coming in an average cost of $281 a square foot because most of that pro part of the project is renovation. A very small portion is the construction. Whereas you go down to the line police new addition, you have for, you're at 540 square feet for the $39,000 a square foot, thank you, for the 39355 foot story addition. So that's all new construction. But in the end, now in the previous slide I said we had 103,000 square feet. Now you'll say, how come it says 111,000 square feet here? These are the unallocated spaces that we talked about earlier. These are spaces that are there, like the gym and all the related spaces off the gym. We're not touching. They're good as is. We can do something with them later. Uh, it's uh, untouched renovation. But we have 111,000 square feet of new space and it averages at $458 a square foot. This gets us to $51.1 million for the hard construction cost, that's brick and mortar cost, do the actual construction work if everything was done in one phase, one step. So how did we get here? So we hired a professional estimator. Uh, we gave them plans, we gave them breakouts, we gave them elevations, details, and they came up with a 33 detailed page report for every discipline, such as the plumber, the mechanical contractor, the fire sprinkler contractor. Everything's broken out by square foot, by length, by cubic yard and they come up with a very detailed number. And then because it's an estimate, we have to put some markups on it because it's not built, it's not bid, and it's not even completely designed yet. So we put some contingencies. We put some safety contingencies into that. So, uh, so our number has a little bit of a buffer. In it. So we go for a recap here. Brick and mortar to do police and auxiliary buildings is 25.34 million. The balance of the project would be towards the bottom there. We have the town hall in Quartz and Gilkinson, that's 15.6. The town hall at Kenyon, which had that low price per square foot, is 6.45 million. And it's a large site. It's, it's a large site package number, which includes a lot of new utilities bringing in, being brought in from the roads. All in, all one phase, $51.1 million. So now, here's, here's our one summary page of this current project. Our number of $458 a square foot that we said before is more than half of renovation costs. We said, let's take a look at that against the 2019 study, see how much of a better deal for the town this could be. So you can say the price is more than $20 million difference. We're getting about 15,000 additional square foot of building space. And our cost per square foot is almost $300 a square foot cheaper. But that's all one phase. 
maybe the town can't do this in one gi one giant step. And I'll get to that after I talk about revenue. <laughs> yeah. So we have a solar array on the site. It's a fully fenced compound. Uh, I could tell you what size the solar array was if I had my stack of papers here. It's a big solar array. <coughs> and uh, it has quantified costs because I looked at all the Central Hudson Bill offsets <coughs> for the Poughkeepsie Day School for three years. They're saving $50,000 a year from the electricity that farm generates. Those savings would be taken out of the monthly and yearly cost the town would be paying, for example, in all the current facilities. Next potential revenue is a cell site. The way cell sites work is they, they, they set a base price per month and they escalate it every year, usually over a 20, 30, or 50 year contract. As of this year, they're getting $32,600 a year in leasing costs. By the last year before the contract renews, it'll be up to $55,000 per year. The site just sits there. It comes, a maintenance truck comes once in a while and checks on the generator and maybe upgrades an antenna or two. And that's just more potential revenue that this site offers. Nothing on the 2019 study addressed is. Last piece is, now there could be sales of the existing town properties. Uh, I went through the assessor's uh, website and pulled all the appraised values for the sites. We're not professional real estate appraisers. I'm using the public data of the assessed value. Town hall site would have 3.5. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, Bob, yeah. yeah. 3.527 million. The police court would be just under 6 million based on the size of the sites and based on what they're appraised at. This is just numbers that, you know, you're talking about $9 million in property sale costs, potentially. Now we're going to get into a split phase project. So again, I recap things because I forget. I think maybe sometimes other people forget too. All the buildings, one initial phase, one construction package, $51.1 million, $458 a square foot. So what did other buildings cost? So we took a look at some <coughs> recent projects across couple of states, but nearby, New Paltz, a new court renovation project, ran at 545. Yeah, hang on. <clears throat> so the New Paltz court building, and I took all their actual construction numbers that I got from other construction. These are all real data. I, went, I didn't just estimate these. But I did escalate them to 2024 costs to match what our $458 per square foot price would be. A small little warehouse that New Paltz turned into a police court renovation came in at $545 a square foot. Queemans Town Hall, $643 a square foot. Ardsley Highway Garage, $656 a square foot. And then, you know, the shock and awe numbers down in Jersey City, 1276 for a public safety building per square foot. New Canaan, Connecticut, 1100 a square foot. And then a couple across the state lines into Connecticut and even Rhode Island, 729 a square foot, 907 a square foot. This is all new construction numbers, except for the top reno one. And that was still $100 higher than our cost per square foot. So we're, we're showing good numbers compared to other projects in the area. So here we have a phase one scope. The area highlighted in light blue or cyan uh, shows everything related to police and court in the Gilkinson building. That includes in the upper right, the auxiliary building. That's gonna be used as a shooting range and vehicle storage and maintenance and uh, 
and other items. So we have all that square footage that we have to get broken out in phase one scope. How do we determine that? They have to get out of the building. The building is in terrible shape and it doesn't get better, it gets worse. So what's left for phase two? We have the town hall amenities and the little leftover spaces that could be, you know, community, could be senior center, could be whatever the town wants it to be. That would be in the lower portion of the Gilkinson, as well as all the work at the Kenyon House. All four floors of renovation, plus the two little additions that Bob showed you for the elevator vertical circulation. On the left and on the right was where we had a small addition for building department offices. So what's that gonna show us? So again, I recap. Midpoint of construction in August of 2024, 51.1 million to do everything as non-phased. If we did the police court as a phase <coughs> one project, we'd bring all the new police two-story building in at 25.4. We called out and our estimator worked quick with us and helped us get these actual numbers of the 33-page cost estimate. 9.79 in renovations in the Gilkinson building for police and courts. And since all the new utilities being brought to the site are for Gilkinson, we're not proposing any, the need for any new uh, utilities brought into Kenyon. So a majority of the site work package has to be carried into phase one. That puts us at 38.35 million for phase one. Now on a previous version, I had, no, I'm not done with that yet, Bob. On a previous version, I had phasing costs plugged in, but our estimator included that in the above numbers. I show this line as zero, just so no one looked at an older version and said they forgot about it. We didn't, it's carried above. Phase one total, 38.35. So what's left? Left is phase two. It's to get everything for town hall into Kenyon at 8.3. It's to get everything for town hall into Gilkinson for 7.47 and the balance, small balance of the site work package, which is mostly uh, parking lot creations and curbing and such, 16.47 million. Now, this, through discussions with members of the town a couple of weeks ago, we took this out five years after the midpoint construction of the phase one. We had, a, we had to pick a time. If I pick a time a year out, that number will go down a bit. If I pick a time 10 years out, that, that'll go up a bit. A five-year deferral is a possibility. It might be longer, but that was the number that was decided upon at five years per annum. So 16.474 for phase two. So the phased total project would come to 54.827 versus the non-phased approach would save about 3.725 million and would eliminate the initial $51 million burden to the town. So, you know, this is the result of the study. These are the conclusions we've come to and the what needs to happen is to decide on some steps that could take place. So, we, and recommendations. This is the existing reports, I think, are fairly clear about the need to do something for police and courts in the near term. And whether you determine to hold off on the town hall stuff is, is beyond, you know, our capability to make a judgment about it all, other than to be able to provide you cost data. But it, you know, clearly the first step is to purchase the property and control it. And then to, or, or concurrently, either way, start the design process to allow you to start the building, the courts and the police building. 
we we have we have people who delay. It's easy to delay, but the cost of inflation of construction is preposterous. You know, the the, uh, the published national data is that in the last year, construction inflation has been eight percent nationally. But that includes places like Alabama and Louisiana. You get up around here, and it, it's probably over 10%. Um, it, it's difficult to prove other than that every project that we've been working on, we see the numbers jumping up. You know, there was another time coming out of the, uh, I, I remember the slowdown in, in 09, 10, 12? When it jumped out of that, prices downstate, lower Westchester, went up 25% in one year. And we're, you know, we're seeing things that, that look like that in other places around. We're doing a lot of work in New England, and we see that there. Um, one local project, I won't, I won't name the name, okay? It, they, we started working with them in 2006. <coughs> They're going to build this coming year. In the intervening time, they've had to scale back the size of the building to 40% of the original size of the building. But because of inflation, the cost to build the building that's 40% the size of the original is 50% higher than the total cost of the original. So it's a, it, you can't outrun it. You can't outrun inflation. The, the value of your tax base is growing at nowhere near what the cost of inflation of construction is growing. So that's all. We just, you know, it, it's, do any board members have any questions at this time? Yeah, the, the phase one cost, that doesn't include the purchase of the property. Correct. So we, right. we need an additional $8 million on top of that cost to purchase the property. That would be For phase correct. one, okay. Semi-correct. We sell the police department, that comes off. Yes, yeah, so if we sell the, well, and we are definitely going to sell the police department, so that's going to offset yeah. a major chunk of that. That was why one of the slides was yeah. about potential yeah. property stuff. So. And the other thing you have to understand, when we do go out to bond during the project, it's being um, banned, so you don't pay the full freight for the, the cost for the first five years during mm -hmm. the thing. So it is a little deferred cost in the beginning. It gives you a chance to find grant money, bonding money, you know, a different route. And the bonding money is going up in price. Okay. Anybody else? Anything else? Gentlemen. Thank you again. Chief, do you have any input that you want to say while you're sitting here? And Chief, along what you've said, the roof, I didn't, didn't come to my attention that we spent close to $100,000 on the roof this year alone in just repairs to the roof. But every time we fix it, we repair it. We did some earlier this year. It's back again in the fall. Chief, that's a metal roof, is it not? Metal roof. So we're having shipping of metal planes. I've been in administration three years. And they're just patches. They were patched twice this year. They're out in the beginning of this year, and they just finished up again last week. IT rooms. So that just go, that just ties into I had talked earlier about the structural framing. There was no noticeable settlement, but we know that that's holding the roof up. To have that many roof issues reoccurring uh, could be evidence that there's some shifting along column lines. And to add to the surprises, when we had to remove the showers. Well, and we have a responsibility to keep our police officers, our staff, and the public safe. Um, that building was a bad idea from the start, and at this point, we need to do something. We can't ignore it. You can't look away. Things, bad things happen when you 
push things further and further into the future and kick the can down the road. There's, there's no, buying a new police station or court isn't like buying a new sports car. Like you don't get to drive around town and show it off. It's, it's just something that you have to do. It's like buying printers and copiers and other things. You, you have a building that you have to put people in. You have to make sure it's safe for those people. And we have a responsibility to do that and take action. It just really, it has to happen now. It can't happen after something occurred. And there's uses for that property, but not as a police station, not as a court. And I think now is the time that we move on as a, as a town and move forward. This property is a fantastic option. It's a nice location. And you mentioned earlier, it's something that you can grow into. I buy stuff for my kids. Sometimes the size are too, too big. And my older daughter yells at me. She's now, she's in, in middle school. She doesn't want a size too, too big. But I like the idea of growing into something. When you buy something that fits exactly the way it's supposed to fit today, you've outgrown it by the time you, you, you wear it. So if we bought something just specifically to fit our immediate needs today to get out of that building, we would outgrow it so quickly because this town has expanded a lot over the years. So this site has all the different things that we could need down the road, and most importantly, what we need immediately. So it's not just a matter of, my, when my kids were in third grade, they learned wants and needs. There's some things that you want, and there's other things that you need. This the town needs to do. So, Stefan, along that line, you know, it's a police building that's substandard to today's view. It's something we need to do, take care of the department we have. But the other piece is that in this cost, what it is, we are gaining for our residents a gym, which we have a daycare. We have a day camp now in the summertime, which is totally outside. This is definitely an asset to that. The day camp will be brought to a more secure location, a better location. The theater and the extra rooms that would be available for other community activities would be a win. So on top of that, these are things that aren't in that study, but it's another added benefit that comes. But back to our number one priority is the safety of our employees and our visitors to the police station. And that is a police station that we have to move out of, move out of that location and find something good. We've looked at multiple locations over the years. This process has been going on even before we brought on Mitchell and Associates to look around and see what we could find. And we probably looked at at least 10 different locations for different spots and different reasons why they didn't pan out, whether they were too small, the locations, you know, the height, the driveways, trying to get in out, you know, difficulty there. We looked at multiple locations throughout the town to try to fit this in. As, as late as a couple months ago, we looked at another location. It was an empty building that they wanted just $7 million for the building. And there really was nothing else around the building except for an empty park a lot and there was nothing else attached to it and it was a building that was on a lease piece of land so that just shows that the price for the building is also valued very well and it's a very well built building as we know ibm built things extremely well so you know and we're getting a building with getting the kenyon house in here is something that definitely has a lot of value you know to the history of the town of poughkeepsie in that building so it's something i think to be proud of when the time comes to get that building accomplished also Correct. Yes. In 1983, I was a sergeant in the police department, and Wayne Thatcher and I wrote a grant, or a couple of grants, that got several million dollars. Mrs. Buckholz, the supervisor, called the chief Lochner, George Lochner, and asked that I be put on a committee for a police building 40 years ago. Okay. 40 years ago. In the process of going through that, Ed Lodi was the architect, very smart man. I think he's, out, I, he's probably retired by now. And we investigated the sites. And one of the sites we call the dump, where our police station is. And there was quite a, a discussion about it. In the town, they kind of favored that, of putting the building out on the dump. Um, I went to the extent of finding the man who ran the town dump, he lived out in Rochdale, and we made a tentative map of what's where. For example, all the bales of paper from Western printing, the scrap paper, the barrels of waste oil and shavings 
from Schatz Federal, De Laval. That's all out there. Okay. How it? It's, not, it's beyond my level. It's forty years. Our police officers are, and, and the support staff are in a building that should be condemned. The walls don't touch the floor, okay? 40 years is enough. I think it's time that we actually take a step and do this. Be the first town board in 40 years to actually do something. Thank you very much for your, your time. Do you have anything else? Uh, you said this is going to be available on our website. Yeah, so we're yeah. going to send a PDF tomorrow. And we'll be going to put together a package. We spoke with Mike Welty today. Okay, good. And we'll be putting together a package with everything that we have, that we have that we can get on the site. Um, we discussed it today, putting okay. a section on the website. It may take okay. a couple of days to get up, but it'll all be on the website. Okay. And I'll put this actual PDF in the summary for that. Mm -hmm. yeah, one piece. Thanks, gentlemen. Thanks Thank for coming. Thanks for spending the time <laughs> and putting this. Thank you for the package together for us. Appreciate it. That brings us on to our committee reports. Finance. Budget done and we're relaxing and enjoying the hard work that Jay put in. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Technology. Yes. Okay, on the website we had oh well almost ten thousand user visits. Nine thousand were new users. And um, the top pages were of course the main page. Leaf pickup schedule, payments, ward structure, and receiver taxes. And then on our government email list, we only have 82 new subscribers and a total of 6,400 subscribers. So busy as always. And some other things, the um, phone, new phones have been installed, yay. And they're currently working on getting the software updated for the phone system and hoping to have that done by the end of November. And they're also planning on having the service upgrades to the internet done by November. We have a new intern. I guess he's a real whiz. He's here two days a week for about six hours total a week. And um, been challenged finding things for him to do because he's really fast. Recreation? Yes, with uh, baseball and softball season over for 2022, the rec department is now winterizing all the water lines and the bathrooms at the fields and the water fountains. Uh, they're all going to be shut down until spring. Um, there's still going to be port port johns at Greenville until the soccer concludes, what, November 20th, I was told? Yeah, which is appreciated because sometimes <laughs> you got these bathrooms. Uh, the rec will also participate in the annual Holly Street Festival, so you can visit them on the Park Green on Raymond Avenue on December 3rd, 11 to 4 p.m., and then, of course, the Caravan of Parade is going to follow that at 5 p.m. And... More recent stuff, introduction to swing dancing will take place this Sunday, uh, November 13th, 3 to 5 at the Senior Center. Uh, registration online or you can call. It's $10 for residents and $15 for non residents. Yeah, I'll, I'll be there. You'll be there. there you yeah. And Try don't forget yourself. the trunk or treat. That was great fun. I never went through so much candy so <laughs> fast in all my life. Eating it or giving it up? I was just not eating it. That was candy. No, I was not it really is not healthy. <laughs> no, I had 350 little bags of candy and they were gone in an hour and 45 minutes. I had to dig into my emergency supply of candy. So, yeah, it was desperate. Yeah. But it was a lot of fun. The costumes were great. The costume contest was so much fun. Good. Infrastructure. Nothing to report. Personnel. Uh, nothing to report. We do have um, posted online a couple um, job openings in the sewer department at this time. Um, building consolidation, we had a presentation tonight. In the supervisor's report, um, besides the fact that we're happy to see that the budget is complete, um, our new comptroller is getting settled into her office, and all the other departments, the highway is working diligently, picking up leaves, and it seems to be a good, smooth changeover. Um, November 9th, today, we're awarded a WIA grant for $1.521 million for a uh, UV for a joint water board, plus also $900,000 for short-term um, loan. So that's going to pay for a good percent of that project down there. There is a lot of um, money out there for water and sewer infrastructure, repairs and different. So this is actually, again, a good thing to see. We've, uh, Spack and Kill, we've got almost half of that money in grant, and this will pay for, I think, almost three quarters of the project down the 
joint water board, which is basically making the best water we could possibly make. We have UV, we have chlorine disinfectant down there also, so we have backups to what we have down there. So it's working very well, and this is definitely something great. And I want to thank all the people involved that help us get this grant money and reaching out because this definitely <coughs> loosens and lightens the burden to the taxpayers to get this kind of money in. Was there anything for fire advisory? Nope. Good. Thank you. I just want to do a quick, you know, public safety announcement with the heating season upon us now. Just, you know, make sure that you ensure that your mechanical equipment, heating equipment is serviced and stuff. Uh, you know, I know a few of the fire departments already had incidents with carbon monoxide, you know, tied strictly to not cleaning their appliances. So make sure you get that done. Also, if you have a fireplace, uh, make sure your chimneys are clean. You know, this is the time for that, those kinds of incidents. Hopefully we can prevent them. Uh, make sure that you have your work and smoke detectors, carbon monoxide detectors. And if anybody out there needs help, you can, you know, call the local fire department, hopefully on the non-emergency line. And I know they'll be willing to go out there to assist with, you know, either putting them up or getting guidance to, to make sure you have them in the right location. Restore Jeff also is advertising, you know, smoke detectors and stuff that people need assistance. Am I correct that um, carbon monoxide is now the law for every resident? Yeah. Is it every floor or is it just? Well, it all depends, like I said, and without going too deep into the code, you're supposed to have a carbon monoxide detector on every level of the floor if you have a sleeping quarters, but you have to have obviously a fuel fire, fuel fired appliance in there. So if you have a, an electric or electric type house, obviously you wouldn't need it because there's no fuel fired appliance unless you have an attached garage. So to be safe, like I said, usually every level of a house something that's fuel fired and, and the sleeping quarters and they're also something to check because they have dates on them and they're as simple as plug-ins some of them yeah a lot of them now like you said uh, even smoke detectors 10 years so it's nice you know for carbon dioxide as well as the smoke detector so you put them up there and you don't have to worry like you have to do it before we have to do it every you know six months or you know we change your clock change your battery stuff so you know it, it's you know they're a little bit more costly but you know, for those that are elderly, you know, that have to try to stand on a stair or something like that to change a, a battery every six months, it, you know, prevents from a possible injury from happening. Okay, thanks. Mr. Supervisor, if I might, um, I'd like to speak for a couple of minutes about Chippy. Chippy? Go ahead. Doesn't that sound happy? Chippy. Yes. Chippy. Mm. Sounds like you have a new friend. It's the Canadian <laughs> Hudson Power Express. All oh, right. It's an eight-foot trench, 333 miles long, to bring two electric cables five and a half inches in diameter down the middle of our Hudson River, make a left turn at Spite and Dival and go into Astoria in Queens. We have water intakes. You may have heard of the Hudson Seven. Those are the seven communities here in the mid-Hudson Valley that take their drinking water from the Hudson River. We do. 16 million gallons a day from our water plant and it's tested six ways to the middle every single day and it's perfectly okay when they take this trench they're going to use what's called a jet plow which is pulled behind a boat and then the cable goes into the ditch and there's a water jet to blow the sediment back into the ditch Okay. The sediment goes into the water column, which goes into our intakes. Our plant is designed and has the technology. If you live in the Hudson Valley, you know every spring the Hudson River is brown, deep brown, full of stuff from the runoff. Your plant is designed to take that out with absolutely no problem. So. My money is on the fact that the plant has the design to protect us from whatever is in the sediment from this 333 mile long, seven foot deep trench. If you took all that stuff and put it into a pile, it would be size of a football field, 10 stories high. That's the amount of material that's gonna be displaced and into the water column. If this gets to a bad point, I'll come before the board and ask for them to take whatever action we have to take. But I want everybody to know that this is going to happen. The city of New York needs electricity. It's going to come this way. It's not going to go 
terrestrial. Alongside the railroad tracks, I already mentioned that, that didn't fly. Going down the Hudson River, one permit, Department of Health, you don't have to, you go down the side of the Hudson River by the railroad tracks, and every municipality, you're gonna to go to planning, zoning, you're gonna to have to get your permission, and the costs just buy tremendous. So the Hudson River is the cheap way to do this. As it goes on, I'll speak more about this. The Hudson River is not somebody's electrical pathway. And if we bury electric cables, how about we do gas pipes? How about we do, just think about what happens once they open the Hudson River up to be some kind of a pathway. I have real serious reservations because of our water plant. And we are in the Hudson 7 and we are one of, and there's six other communities that get the drinking water. Something happens to the sediment in the river. Now think what's in the sediment of the river, like coal tar, and see that in the water column and see the implications. So it gets my concern. And if it gets to the point where we need, really need to do something, like with lawyers, I'll come back to the board and tell you. But this is not a small thing. This is gonna be of significant proportion and it's gonna affect every single river community that takes their water from the river. When is it set to happen? Start. Oh. They're starting. And New York State fully approved it? Department of Health said yes. The, um, and is there some sort of bond to protect the towns and municipalities? They have to put a bond up. I don't know if it's been done or not. So if they, we're talking about, think about the electricity coming from Canada, going down the Hudson River and into Astoria, Queens. <clears throat> How much money do you think that's going to make? Huh. Okay. I don't like to be in that spot, but the truth is money talks. They're putting this thing in and it's going down to Spike and Dive, down to Spike and Dive and into Astoria, Queens. Spike and Dive, isn't that Del Devil's Elbow? Is that what that means? Yeah. 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 But as Bill said, they tried to come in and sell the fact that it could be a pilot in the middle of the river. The only time you got a pilot for something in the river. And I will say the county stepped up and squashed that real quick as it was trying to get through. And along what Bill said is coming down the river is one thing. We have two intakes and it's literally coming down the center. Think in your mind of how much money GE spent to clean up part of their mess that may not even be clean. They were gonna come through, plow it, dig it back up. Earlier this year, we had an issue with one of the dams up north where they they could empty one side, it would be cleaner, and the other side would be dirtier. But what came down from that dam came all the way down to here, and it cost us tens of thousands of dollars in extra filtration to get that out of the water back then. So what this would do, and what this could possibly do to our water would this, be hard. This is gonna, there may come a point in time, ladies and gentlemen, in our town, where I might have to say to you, this is the time where you really gotta put the fire to the feet of the politicians who make these decisions. And, you know, and it's well above our level. It's not a funny discussion, but- That you know, was yesterday. They came here and they discussed it, you know, what they wanted to do. And I said, well, why aren't you just running along the rail bed? You know, why are you using the river? Mm -hmm. A, it's cheaper, is number two. So I said, you're going all the way from Canada and other countries. I said, so we end up like Russia, you know, being owners to our electric to a country that we're friends with, with Canada now, so we may not be next week. But then I said to him, I says, why aren't you going up on shore? Oh, we get down on Rockland County over around Havistore. We're going up on shore. I go, why? That's where the sturgeon habitat. I said, so 200, 300, 400,000 people from here to Albany, you can put their life at risk, but you're worried about the sturgeon in the water. I said, where, where does this, you know, come from? I said, so definitely the mentality of... We're not making this, this up. No. This is real stuff. This is the way these discussions go. Yeah. It's so ridiculous. Sometimes you think they're not connected to reality. And the other times you know that they're not connected. The to bottom reality. line is our water. And that river moves four miles every day out. So whatever comes from Albany could take weeks to get here. You know, so it's not like... They stir it up, and you think in your mind, they stir it up four hours later. It's clear. Turn so everything back just up. keep pouring down our way for... Yeah, yep. it goes, the tide goes up, and then it goes out negative four miles. So 
what's below us, if it happened in Cold Spring, it wouldn't matter. It wouldn't be coming up before it comes up. It takes a long time to come back down. That's why we had the issue with the reservoir dumping all the muddy water in. They're going to buy us all those survivalist straws and have us drink out of puddles. No. They, they have a, they have a <laughs> plan have. for emergency of what to do with the water. But as Bill has said many times, where do you find 15 million gallons of water a day? That, that, right. There's exactly. not enough tractor that's trailers that's to bring that kind of water thing. into this town. That's just us. Yeah. There's right. not enough puddles to drink from, is yeah. what you're saying. Yes. Does anybody have anything else? Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye.